All right, so we have the, the pleasure, nay, the, the honor of hearing David Holton talk about the end of Kerberos and NTLM, NTLM1, and man, you really like giving me a hard <laughs> one to go. Um, cracking desk, so please welcome and uh, give, give it up for Hakari, David Holton. All right, thanks a lot for showing up here. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about cracking DES today. Um, does everybody here know what DES stands for? Okay, well we're gonna be talking about a slight variant of DES. Uh, it's called the Data Encryption Shark. Um, <laughs> I don't know how this made this into my slides here, but um, there may be some sharks in this presentation. So um, did, did anybody here catch my uh, talk I gave with Moxie back in 2012 on cracking MS Chat V2? Okay, a couple people. Um, so, uh, MS Chat V2 uh, stands for the MicroShark Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, and uh, provides mutual authentication with a password, and specifically focused on um, uh, usage with PBTB VPNs, uh, also used for WP Enterprise, and um, and a number of other protocols. And this, uh, the research that we presented was nothing new. It was uh, actually the sim very similar attack was outlined by a bunch of cryptographers back in 1999, and we just um, kind of uh, revisited that. And basically, the, the paper showed that state actors, you know, could easily crack this, and it was widely used in, in Windows. <coughs> oh. Did you guys see something? That's weird. Huh, okay. <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, so basically, uh, how it works is that uh, you connect to a server, it sends a uh, client challenge, and, um, and then, the, then the, uh, the client generates a hash and then uh, it basically uses their, NT, their, their user password that's converted into an NT hash, and, uh, and then encrypts the challenge to create the response and sends it back to, to authenticate with the server. And up until this point, people had basically just been at uh, attacking the user password, and, um, and this was really good for people who had weak passwords. But if you're really trying to crack every pos go through every possible password, um, this ends up being a very large key space that you have to go through. And so the attack that we presented was uh, basically just uh, trying to crack DES to recover the NT hash, which in a lot of cases can be used as the password equivalent to authenticate to, um, to these networks. And so um, uh, DES, you know, uh, people think that it's insecure. Uh, you know, because two to the 56, and um, initially people thought, oh, this is like similar to triple DES, but really uh, this is three separate DES operations, so it's additive and not, um, you know, not doesn't exponentially, exponentially increase. So it's really, you know, uh, they outlined that it's closer to two to the 57 uh, that you have to that you have to go through in order to actually brute force this. And um, the the key thing here is that uh, this last key is actually only 16 bits long, and so that's pretty easy to, to crack, uh, just because your, your NT hash is only 16 bytes long. And so you're really just tr trying to crack two DES keys. And um, another interesting thing here is that your challenge hash is uh, the plain text that's used in both these operations. And so uh, normally how you'd implement this is you would go through the full key space twice uh, to crack both of these keys, but because your plain text is the same, you can go through it just once and then do two compares afterwards to see if you found the right key. And so that's kind of the, the attack that we presented. And, uh, oh, whoa, what? Oh, weird. No. Oh, sh <laughs> Okay, okay, get out of here, sharks. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. All right, yeah. <laughs> mm. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, we, we demonstrated that it could be do done in two of the 56 DES computations. And the key thing is that we made it so anybody could do this instead of just, uh, you know, governments and stuff like that. So how this worked is, uh, uh, Moxie released this program called ChapCrack that you could point at a PCAP file, and it would extract out the information to uh, uh, basically create a token that you could then submit to CloudCracker, and then that would go onto an FPGA cluster that we put together. And uh, within 24 hours, it would send you the NT hash uh, for that MS Chap v2 uh, communication. In this case, we we supported uh, PPTB VPNs and WP Enterprise. And so, um, yeah, in this day and age, DES should be super easy to crack, right? Uh, back in 1999, the EFF DES cracker uh, was, you know, invented, and uh, it took around 9.2 days, and so with Moore's Law, you'd think it would be really fast now. Um, so looking at doing this in around 24 hours, uh, using CPU instances, it would take around 80,000 CPU cores uh, to crack a key, which is pretty expensive, um, even in the cloud. 
Uh, then there's also GPU instances that are also fairly expensive. And uh, so what we did was uh, we happened to have some FPGA hardware laying around, and um, we were able to provide this at around $20 a key just using kind of spare FPGA hardware. I mean, one of these systems about five years ago would cost around 150 grand for the system, but uh, we, uh, we put this on as an online service just for, to create awareness. And it ended up getting relocated into my basement, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's my basement. Um, oh, whoa. And <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> so then, of course, everybody rushed to fix everything, right? That's, that's what happens whenever you show that there, something's vulnerable. Uh, hi. <laughs> Uh, and so one, one of the VPN providers that we called out in our talk was, uh, specifically was iPredator, and all that they did was just added a little thing to their website, discouraging people from using PPTP, but uh, of course everybody still supports this. And then uh, people kind of dismissed uh, WP Enterprise uh, attacks as being, oh, well, everybody does strong certificate checking, so this isn't really an issue. Um, and of course, everybody here does strong certificate checking with every uh, WP Enterprise network they connect to. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. So since then, um, we got some interesting jobs. <coughs> uh, like, for example, um, you know, this first one up here looks like uh, what you would kind of expect from uh, you know, a, a challenge and response that we're trying to crack. Uh, but then we, we saw these ones where it's like 11223344. And we also saw these ones where um, the two ciphertexts are the same. And so people were obviously using the service to crack other things besides uh, just MSChat v2. And um, one day the traffic to our website dropped off and I noticed that cloudcracker.com was down. I emailed Moxie and he never replied to me, so I don't know what happened to him. But um, we ended up reinventing this as a service uh, that Turcon uh, provides. And it basically is just a web interface to the, the FPGA cluster in my basement. <clears throat> so <laughs> so we, de we decided to kind of reinvent the service a little bit, figure out what people were actually using this for and try to just add some additional support. Uh, for all these different features. <clears throat> and uh, the real point of this whole service is to, you know, like, it's kind of the grand experiment of how do we finally kill a legacy crypto algorithm that's, like, so pervasive. And, and, um, and so hopefully, you know, after all of this awareness, eventually it'll finally get phased out of all these major products. So um, one thing that we found out was that uh, what people were using this for was... Uh, uh, with uh, have, has anybody here used SMB Capture or like Responder or anything like that um, on kind of Windows pen testing engagements? So Landman and NTLM v1, which are kind of legacy authentication um, protocols now for just authentication authenticating to a Windows share, um, they there's all these tools out there to kind of set up a fake Samba server and then do downgrade attacks and uh, capture this uh, this challenge response. And so um, the default <coughs> uh, the default uh, challenge that SMB Capture sends out is this 11223344, and the people were using that to crack uh, Windows authentication. And, uh, and so it turns out that you can basically take uh, the values that um, SMB uh, Capture or Responder spit out, and, uh, and it, it's essentially MSChap v1, which is pretty similar to MSChap v2, but you can provide the whole, the whole challenge. And so uh, you can plug that right into our, our website and essentially crack someone's NT hash just with this authentication. And, uh, and then this you know, obviously works no matter how complex the person's password is because you're actually cracking the NT hash and not the, not the password. And so, um, so yeah, we kind of made uh, updated the site to, to take these hashes directly from, from SMB Capture. And, uh, and then same with if you're using Responder, you can essentially just copy and paste it in the website and, um, and then get the NT hash for, for any sort of uh, net capture. Oh, shit. <laughs> what was that? So uh, then also with WPA2 Enterprise, um, things have kind of evolved a little bit since then. Now, um, uh, you know, I've talked to some people, and it turns out there's still lots of uh, environments out there that don't do, authentic, uh, don't do proper certificate checking. A uh, big surprise. And uh, there's, there's some better tools out now. Um, and so now if you ever come across a WPA Enterprise network, you can... Um, run host APD and do kind of evil twin attacks and capture um, essentially their, their net LM and copy and paste it into the website and for $20 within 24 hours you'll get um, basically access to the network um, because 
the NT hash that you get from us, you can plug right into your WPA supplicant config file and then authenticate to the network or go through and decrypt the, the, the traffic or whatever you've captured for that network. Ah, man, there, there's more and more of these sharks in my presentation. <laughs> uh, and then also, um, there's, uh, there was some research done somewhat recently uh, by Karsten Knoll about uh, how doing over-the-air updates to SIM cards, um, all of the authentication with that is basically done with a uh, single DES on a lot of carriers. And so this is actually featured in Mr. Robot uh, a little while ago. <clears throat> uh, and so we, we also added this uh, just general purpose interface for, to allow anybody to crack DES if you find it in any, any sort of applications out there. And, uh, and so it's just based on simple rules with like masks and you provide essentially the information you know about, um, about what's happening. It'll go through all the possible DES keys and kind of send you uh, a list of all the ones that match that criteria. And so as a kind of a, to demonstrate this uh, general purpose interface, uh, we thought we'd try just using uh, Kerberos as kind of an example for this. And so um, uh, does anybody here use Kerberos in their environments or looked at Kerberos a little bit? Um, have, has anybody, out of, out of those people, have you seen DES used in the wild at all? DES CBC or RC4? Okay. Well, um, some people are still using DES. I, I know that for my day job, we still use DES on our network. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it turns out that with Kerberos, it's really trivial to downgrade. And so um, a lot of these legacy networks that still support it, um, you can easily downgrade it by uh, just using a simple editor cap filter. And so this is on our, on our GitHub where uh, if you look over here in the encryption types, uh, we just substitute any encryption type with DES, CBC, CRC, and, uh, and that causes everything to just downgrade to that, and then uh, you can use that to, um, oh yeah, you can also use Wireshark uh, to capture this. Uh, I mean, here, here's some Wireshark captures here, um, and uh, uh, <laughs> wait, what, what's that? <laughs> I guess, I guess uh, sharks are hackers too, uh, according to Google. So, um, and then uh, once, you, once you capture this, uh, uh, these Kerberos packets, uh, it's all based on ASN1, and so um, there's lots of known plain text just in the ASN1 um, encoding. And so uh, we, we can automatically extract out uh, basically the known plain text and create a token to submit it to the website. And, um, <clears throat> and because of CBC, it's relatively easy to, to generate all of that. So uh, this is kind of an example of running it on a Kerberos capture that has uh, some DES traffic, and then uh, these are the submission tokens that you can just submit directly to uh, the website to crack the DES key. And actually, um, I, 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 I'm really horrible at Kerberos, and so I kind of presented this at uh, a couple conferences recently, and somebody emailed me and uh, showed me how to use these keys to actually authenticate to the network. So now um, you can basically take the key that we uh, crack for you within 24 hours, and now you can authenticate to the Kerberos network uh, through Linux. And so, anyway, there's some, oh, whoa. <laughs> so uh, I also started receiving emails on uh, people asking if I could crack uh, DES crypt files uh, or uh, DES crypt hashes from um, like old shadow files and password files. And has anybody come across any DES uh, like crypt hashes and shadow files or a couple people? Okay. Uh, what, what sort of operating system did you? Uh, a very sadly old version of Linux. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, voting machine. Voting machine, nice, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so initially, uh, this was designed to uh, run on a PDP-11, so it would take more than one second to compute, and computers have surprisingly become a little bit faster since then. Um, but, of course, nobody uses this anymore, right? And so, obviously, there's some people that do. Um, another one that we found is that a lot of the, these people are requesting this. Um, we're doing car hacking, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the infotainment systems in cars uh, use Qnix, which I guess still supports uh, DES. And it's actually the more secure version. They also have another um, proprietary version of, uh, of their own, their own uh, password hashing algorithm that's fully reversible. So, so it's actually much more secure. Um, and so, uh, so we just went, went through the internet and tried to find as many of these hashes as we could. Uh, like um, this one up here is from uh, like the Charlie, Mil Charlie Miller and Chris Velasek GPAC. Uh, there's another presentation that I just found, found one of these in on car hacking. There's tons on the internet. And so um, I implemented this so it just goes through the full key space. And um, so no matter what, how difficult the password is, it'll crack it. And uh, it takes around three days on the, on the system that we have. 
And so um, <clears throat> you can just plug it into the, into the website, and within you know, a few days, you'll get the password no matter what. And so uh, we started looking around for secure passwords, and um, I, I asked uh, my buddy Carl uh, if he had any really secure ones that he could send me, and he sent me this one that's used in all of the OnStar systems, and uh, so we ran it through here, and it, it turns out the password is root. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then like, yeah, the Jeep one is like, all these are like lowercase, uh, you know, um, relatively easy to crack with just John the Ripper. So uh, since then, I've, I've received some that are actually pretty complex that are used in like boats and other things like that. But um, if any of you are interested in trying to crack any of these, uh, yeah, just let me know and uh, we can run it on the system. <laughs> wow, elevators everywhere. <laughs> uh, so when will this ever get fixed? Um, <clears throat> Does anybody here remember like session hijacking and uh, you know stealing cookies and stuff like that? And then also remember Fire Sheep, where they basically made it so anybody and their grandma could uh, you know log into arbitrary Facebook accounts if you're just at you know Starbucks. Um, and so uh, so kind of our uh, our whole philosophy here is that you know if we make this easy for everybody to do, then eventually it'll get fixed. And so that's kind of the, the current strategy. And so. Um, the, we're really asking ourselves, like, how do we motivate change and make this even more easier for people to do? And so the biggest problem is that we charge for the service, and uh, the reason why we do that is mostly because, you know, I only have one of these FPGA clusters, and it takes a decent amount of time uh, to crack. And, uh, and, you know, we do have to pay for air conditioning and power and stuff like that, but it's mostly a form of just load balancing, you know, and, and uh, rate limiting with the service. <clears throat> and uh, so what if we can make the service free? <laughs> um, so, so we looked into making a rainbow table for this, um, and it's a relatively large key space, uh, like the largest um, uh, off-crack table or, you know, uh, standard uh, rainbow table I could find was so somewhere around 2 to the 52, and um, it was around 2 terabytes. And so our goal was uh, basically to make, um, you know, one for the whole DES key space, which is about 10 times bigger than the largest uh, table out there. And, um, and then also, you know, making a reasonable size so, so we could, and, and a reasonable crack speed, like close to real time, so we could just offer this as a service and, uh, and not have to worry too much about rate limiting. <clears throat> so um, the hardware that I picked up was uh, six terabytes of NVMe storage. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I kind of borrowed some FPGAs from, from the office. <laughs> and I uh, also borrowed a server and, um, <clears throat> and came up with some, some rough parameters. So uh, I managed to borrow a, a decent amount of hardware to generate the tables, um, and you know got everything all laid out, and uh, you know was ready to get going. And then of course there's always hardware issues when when you're dealing with hardware. So like FPGAs started overheating. We started having like uh, we, we weren't uh, expecting uh, FPGAs to go from like you know drawing say two amps up to drawing 40 amps like in you know in a split second. And so there there are all sorts of things we had to overcome. Uh, but eventually, all these things got fixed, and uh, we spent weeks generating uh, basically kind of the first couple tables and ran into some issues in that um, uh, we had cl collision rate problems and effectively made the tables unusable. So we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and um, came up with some new parameters that made it more like around 12 seconds to crack a key instead of three seconds, but um, seemed totally fine. <clears throat> And then, of course, we went back to, uh, to generate stuff, and then some customer ordered hardware, and so we had to, like, ship it out or something. Um, so anyway, it took, took a while to generate everything, but um, eventually we had tables generated. Um, we got a, this cracking system up. Right now we have, you know, six FPGAs, and these NVMe drives are pretty tiny, so they're kind of off to the side, and all of the air is just kind of directed straight onto the FPGAs. And uh, it turned out that our coverage was actually better than expected. Um, Right now, uh, we're at about 99.65% accuracy um, uh, coverage. So, um, you know, one in 200 times, you'll um, you'll crack your key, and um, <clears throat> and then uh, yeah, w when you're cracking the two keys, and your coverage drops slightly because you know it's relying on both of them getting cracked. But then, if we don't find it immediately, then we just offload it to the cracking rig, and then it takes you know a day to to find it. So um, so yeah, we currently have this up and running, and um, on average, it takes you know less around 20 seconds or something to find your keys. 
No. <laughs> a shark. <laughs> so anyway, um, it's free. And you can uh, start using this right now. We also have an API that we released, so you can tie this directly into your tools. And um, one of the key things uh, to note is that this is specifically for cracking Windows authentication. Um, so uh, using SMB Capture or, uh, or Responder. And um, if we have, do we have some time? Is Riverside in here? I think we have, uh, okay, we have a couple minutes. So I can, I can just show you this demo real quick here. Um, so using Responder, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> so, oh. Yeah, so normally, you know, you fire up Responder, and then um, if there's any Windows machines on your network that are vulnerable to um, this downgrade attack, then um, uh, any sort of file share that they go to, or um, you'll, you'll just start getting floods of, uh, of servers connecting to you, because um, it's basically responding for any sort of NetBIOS lookup request. And so now, um, now we have our NTLM v1 uh, authentication here, and so we can copy this and um, paste it into... You basically just say nt-hash and paste it into here. Then you can give it your email address. And uh, I didn't want to do this connected to the internet, and so you'll, you'll basically receive uh, an email kind of like this within about 20 seconds. And then you can take your ntlm hash, which is right here, and uh, then go back over to here, and oh, here, I'll just I have this canned here. So then you can do smb client, and now, now you're connected as administrator or whatever. Um, and then you can also, you know, do uh, uh, any sort of like PS exec stuff to basically, you know, get it pop a shell on this on the system as um, as that user, and uh, <clears throat> and then yeah, you, you aren't relying on any of the other sort of uh, you know injection or relay attacks and stuff like that. It's uh, now you have basically the password equivalent for that user, no matter how complex their password is. So. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, the kind of the big thing here is that, you know, we've known that this is an issue since the late 90s. Um, we knew that you could build custom ASICs for about 200 grand, that would do it in nine days, and if you were to build the same thing nowadays, in theory, it could crack any DES key in around a minute and a half. And, uh, and so it's, you know, no surprise that FPGAs can do it in, you know, in a matter of hours or seconds uh, doing different techniques. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think this is kind of a bigger issue with with this algorithm, can we really get this phased out and get people to stop using it? Because um, this will probably become an even bigger issue, you know, in the future with with uh, the other algorithms that we have out now. So, uh, right now, you can check out um, uh, crack.sh. Uh, we have uh, an API set up if you want to tie this directly into Responder, just to automatically crack these uh, NT hashes. Um, we have some plugins, like there's an Airbot plugin if you want to just like submit stuff directly through Slack or IRC or um, something like that. And, um, and we also have all the code for the uh, rainbow table stuff up on GitHub. So if you want to run one of these systems for yourself, uh, all the code is there. Um, we haven't ha figured out the best way to host or uh, mirror this six terabyte uh, rainbow table, but if you have any ideas, let me know. And uh, there's, yeah, tons of people that contributed to all the, all the research in this, so lots of thanks to them. And um, <clears throat> so help me kill legacy crypto. If any of you want to try to crack some stuff, just shoot me an email and I'll let you run free jobs in the system. Um, tons of info online. And, uh, and then of course, come out to tour camp. I'm sure everybody's been barding, been barding you with that the whole weekend. But, um, <laughs> so uh, we might have time for one or two questions, uh, if there are any. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>